free here. Just for you. <laughs> yeah. They should let me do it. Straight down. Wow. Impressive. does have uh, some things to tell us about uh, this significant day of experiencing and witnessing baptism together. So let's read Romans 6, 1 through 4. What shall we say? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Romans 6, 1-4. Let me take a moment to pray. Father, thank you so much for this truth that you have given to us in your word. Thank you for the message of Jesus Christ dying on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins, rising on the third day from the dead, conquering sin and death and hell forever, so that all who believe in him might have everlasting life. Lord, this is the gospel message, the good news that we rejoice in this day. And I thank you for uh, even this opportunity today to witness Nora's baptism, proclaiming her faith and trust in you as Savior and Lord of her life, dying to the old way and living to this new way of life in Jesus. Lord, we, we pray for her today and thank you for all of her family and the support that they have given her and all the church family who have uh, been praying for her, encouraging her, teaching her along the years. Lord, we pray that this would be a day where you are honored and glorified and uh, where it's a significant moment for Nora as she takes this incredible step of faith. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And you may be seated. Just share a couple of uh, announcements with you here this morning. Uh, you can see in your bulletin a number of the uh, things happening and coming up. So I won't take time to read all of those. But in particular, this Hope Petersburg flyer that you have is a, as an insert. Uh, you may be seeing a little bit about that coming up. But... Uh, this is kind of a joint effort between a few of the churches here in town where um, it's going to be just a fun family event day. Uh, think like block party on a, maybe a little bit bigger scale down at Geary Park uh, on Saturday, August 3rd. Uh, the, the, the main idea behind all of this is an opportunity for us to witness and engage people in our community with the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
There will be testimonies given at different times throughout the day, as well as some of these uh, different fun things that you can see listed here on the flyer. Additional things beyond that. But here's what I want to say. If you are interested in being a part of uh, serving that day, I would love to talk with you about some ways that we can do that. So we will have a booth there representing our church and um, have opportunities to engage in other things from maybe being parking attendants to helping out with the uh, food distribution and other things like that. So if you are interested in helping, let me know. You can just uh, text me or, or call me, contact me, um, or come to Saturday mornings ministry leadership team meeting and we will flesh out some additional details there as well. So it's an opportunity for us to be involved in, in helping out serving witnessing in our community. So I'll let you read the rest of the announcements there on your own, uh, but some good stuff coming up. There's always great things happening at the First Baptist Church, and so appreciate all those in ministry uh, positions, making sure things are moving in the right direction and uh, applying these opportunities for us. Uh, one thing I do want to add is that you see in your bulletin the uh, disaster relief offering that we received from Vacation Bible School. $432.51. Amen. Most of that in pennies, nickels, and dimes. Praise the Lord for that. And uh, all those who helped count uh, those uh, coins, appreciate their work as well. Uh, Lori and Bev uh, say, yeah, yeah, yeah. Grateful for the uh, gifts that came in. They're, they're happy to count the pennies. Don't, don't let them fool you. Uh, but I would love for us to send a check of $500 or more to the Illinois Baptist Disaster Relief. And if you are so inclined and would love to give just a little bit, if you can help us, you can, I'll tell you what, you can empty out your pennies this morning out of your pocket, put them in, we, we need to do it this way. Can we get, um, can we get a different bucket? Amy, can you find like a little bucket or something or somewhere back there? Rather, we'll, we'll just say it this way, rather than put it in the offering box just to make it separate, we will have whatever she finds. She found something. All right, perfect. Do the boys have to put it in the boys' bucket? Do the girls have to put it in the girls' bucket? So that's what we'll do. All right. So, yeah, just on the way out, right, put it in the foyer out there. So on the way out today, if you put money in one of those buckets, boys in the boys, girls in the girls, uh, then I think, I think we can hit this 500 mark in a snap. So if you can help out today... That would be very much appreciated, and I think uh, that would be a great uh, way for us to finish out the BBS offering and get that sent to the Illinois Baptist Ambassador. All right, one other thing I want to share with you very quickly here this morning, and that is that uh, we have a couple in our church, Claude and Mary Davis, who are celebrating 70 years of marriage this Wednesday. And Mary, can you just wave to us back there so everybody can see you? 70 years of marriage. Hey, I've got to ask, I've got to ask, how do you do it? What's the secret to 70 years of marriage? Commitment. Commitment. Good communication. She's always right. Penny said, she is always right. Well, we just want to say congratulations to you. Wow, what an example of commitment and communication and the faithfulness along the way that has sustained you and God's grace holding you up for 70 years and a family that has been so supportive and encouraging along the way. You've raised some incredible uh, people in your life, you know, children, grandchildren, and uh, been an influence in this community for a long time. And uh, we are so glad to have you here and uh, so glad to celebrate that occasion with you. So, yeah, again, 70 years for Claude and Mary Davis. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right. Well, we are going to have a baptism in just a few minutes, but uh, we've got a couple of songs. But before that, we don't do this very often. We kind of used to do it a lot, but uh, haven't done it for a while. I want to take just a few moments for you to have a chance just to stand up. And greet somebody that maybe you haven't spoken with yet this morning and just tell them that you are glad that they are here and 
Appreciate them not staying out so late at the county fair all this week. They couldn't <laughs> come to church this morning. So take just a moment to stand and greet one another today, if you will. Penny, if you might find another later. Just greet each other. <laughs> <laughs> We're glad you did so much there. Like, like, yeah, not, not a sarcastic one. <laughs> hey, good morning. Welcome. Sophie, can you do this for me? Can you take that camera and just hang around and go greet people so that those watching at home can see who's here? Just for fun. Uh, August?
seated. Oh! <laughs> 
exciting day in the Lord. Amen? Amen. Hey, maybe somebody else is out there thinking, you know what? I probably need to do just what Nora did today. Maybe you've already given your life to Christ, but you haven't taken that next step of obedience and faith in Jesus to be baptized. You know what? That water's going to be warm for just a little while longer. I don't know if you brought an extra set of clothes with you or not today, but uh, we can make arrangements. And if that's you, if you're thinking about that, maybe God's been prompting your heart to say, you know what, that is the next thing I need to do. I need to follow in the obedience of the faith of being baptized. And I already trusted Jesus as Lord and Savior of my life, but I know I need to do this. I would love, I mean, I would love to talk with you about that, and that if that's your next step. Maybe maybe somebody's there thinking, you know what, I, I just I don't know about this Jesus. I'm not even sure, you know, what you're talking about when you talk about being saved and new life. What, what do you mean? Well, that's a conversation we're going to have this morning as well here in our message together. But I really want you to listen because this could be the most important decision you ever make in your life. It will be. You'll either, you'll either make the most important decision to trust Jesus as Savior and Lord and follow Him as uh, faithfully as you know how to do, or you will ignore Him or reject Him and choose to do your own thing your own way. Now, if you follow Jesus, the road leads to everlasting life. But if you follow the other road... Your own way and whatever else the world says to do, it's going to lead to eternal separation in a place called hell. It's important stuff. Uh, and I don't want to gloss over that uh, in any way. But we've all, we, we all will make a decision one way or another on whether to choose Jesus or to reject him. We are in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 this morning. If you have your Bible, uh, go ahead and look with me there. I'm going to read verses 13 and 14 uh, together and, uh, and put them together here in just a little while. First Corinthians 16, I'll get that later, uh, says this. <laughs> be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. Let's pause in a moment to pray. Father, I thank you so much for the love that you put on display for us. For while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, taking our sin upon himself on the tree, bearing our burden, satisfying the wrath of a righteous and holy and just God so that we don't have to experience death and separation and hell from you, but that we can be made right with you and have the joy of and the hope of being in your presence forever. Starting right here and right now with being made new in Jesus, being born again, alive in Christ, and having the, the abundant life that you have come to give to us, that we could know uh, the, the fullness of life with you, even here on earth while we wait for better things to come. Lord, that we have your presence with us day by day. We have the measure of your peace and your joy within us. We have your Holy Spirit dwelling within our hearts through faith. God, it is an abundant life, full of purpose and meaning, as nothing else can offer. And yes, we have this promise laid up for us in heaven, the inheritance that is ours through Christ, an eternal hope that resides within our hearts. God, we are so grateful for all that you have done to make this life possible. And Lord, my prayer is today that if there is even one person, maybe watching online or perhaps in this room, who has never yet put their faith in Jesus for salvation, that this would be the day that they would turn away from sin and trust you with their whole heart. God, let your will be done. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, Paul, toward the end of this letter, is giving some <coughs> concluding exhortations to the church. And um, one thing I want to highlight to, as much as anything this morning is that everything that we do should be done in love for everyone that God puts in our path. Do everything in love, verse 14. Everything that you think, everything that you, every word that you say should be done in love, and it should be with a love for all whom God has put within your path, whether that's friends or Family, co-workers, neighbors, um, classmates, people that you get along with great, 
and people that rub you the wrong way. People who treat you well and people who don't treat you well. People who share your biblical values and people who don't share your biblical values. So that makes this a really easy message then, right? Uh, for all of us. Just, just love everybody. Piece of cake. Well, it is easy enough to say, but it's not as easy to know how to do that. Especially when the very word love can mean different things to different people. I'll give you some examples. You probably don't need me to tell you this, but uh, we use love just in all kinds of flippant ways in our culture, don't we? Like, you know, you might say something like, you know, I love that new show that's come out, uh, you know, on your favorite streaming platform or whatever. Um, I love going to the beach. I love working in the garden. I love Edie's double fudge brownie ice cream. You know, things like that that people say, you know, quite a lot. And on the other hand, we also say, and I love my wife, and I love my children, and I love my grandchildren. And so, you know, there's different elements or degrees or levels to what we're talking about when we use the word love. I guess I love Edie's double fudge brownie ice cream, but not as much as I love my wife, you know. So how we use love does matter. And uh, verse 14 here, he says, let all that you do be done in love. Now, this word in the biblical language in which it was originally written, the Greek, is called agape. Maybe you've heard that before. Uh, it is a rich word that incorporates the ideas of affection, of goodwill, benevolence. Uh, there's another word for brotherly love, phileo, that uh, makes up part of the word Philadelphia, that roots out of there. But, uh, but the agape love... It does incorporate also the idea of a brotherly love, even to a higher degree. Sometimes we might think of it as uh, like an unconditional love. It's a sacrificial love. It's generous. It's giving. It's kind. In short, it's a love a lot like the way that God loves us. When God sent his son into the world, it was out of his agape for us. His desire that we would not live apart from him. That we would not experience his wrath because of our sinfulness against him, but that he would make a way through his son Jesus on the cross of Calvary and by his resurrection victory that we could have everlasting life. For God so loved the world that he gave, it's a giving, he gave his only begotten son so that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Just to give you some more context for what that word looks like in the New Testament, uh, in the book of John, which John is fond of using that word, chapter 13, for instance, verse 35. I'll read 34 and 35 together here for you. Um, where, where, where are we at? John chapter 13, 34 and 35. Jesus says, a new commandment I give to you that you do what? Love one another. How does that love look? Well, he explains that, just in case there were any questions. What do you mean, love one another? Well, he says, I'm glad you asked that question. Here's how I want you to love one another. Just as I have loved you, so you also must love one another. And he goes on to say, it's by this that all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. He goes on in John chapter 15, verse 13, another familiar verse. And it says, greater love has no one than this. Than what? Yeah. Lays down his life for yeah. You all mumbled a little bit, but I think I heard what you said. <laughs> that a man would lay down his life for his friends. That is the kind of agape love that Jesus is talking about. That he commands us to put into practice for one another. It is a... Giving love, a sacrificial love even, that goes above and beyond um, for one another. Paul is fond of that word as well. He uses it in various letters, for instance, in the church uh, that he writes to in Rome. Chapter 12, verse 9, he says, let love be genuine. So there's a, an aspect of the sincerity of heart that accompanies that love. It's not just doing things out of an obligation, perhaps but out of a real desire from the inside to want to bless someone else. Let love be genuine. 
abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good, he says. In Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, he says it this way, Be imitators of God, therefore, as beloved children, and walk in love. Walk, there is uh, simply a way of saying live in love. Let it be the very life uh, that you exude. The way that you live your life ought to be lived in love. As Christ loved us. There again, we see the standard for the way that we are to love one another is the way that Jesus has loved us. As Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So we are, on one hand, blessing others in the way that we love sacrificially, generously, selflessly, sincerely. But it is done as an offering to God. And everything that we're talking about, when we're talking about these commands, essentially, to love one another, it is a command. Uh, we do it because God has first shown his love to us. We love because he first loved us. Every command you see in the Bible, with the do's, the don'ts, the uh, thou shalt, the shall nots, it's all grounded in the very nature and character of God himself, who knows what is good for us, who knows where the guardrails ought to be placed in our lives so that we don't drive over the edge of the cliff and find ourselves at the bottom of a ravine somewhere struggling for life. He calls us to do what he wants us to do for our good and for his glory. And so these commands aren't just random. They're, they're always grounded in the very nature, the character of God, and essentially of his love for us. Let me give you one more scripture. We could be here all morning doing this, just looking at these uh, words, uh, this, this word in particular, this word agape throughout the New Testament. Um, but go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. If you were already in 1 Corinthians earlier, you're not too far away. But here's the famous chapter in the New Testament on love that helps us to see what this looks like just a little bit more fleshed out. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Paul writes here saying, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging Symbol, And if I have prophetic power to understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned but have not love, I gain nothing. In other words, you can do a lot of great and religious and super spiritual and even sacrificial things, but if it's not done out of a love in your heart, then it is meaningless and it is worthless. Now, here's what love looks like. If you ever want a definition of love or at least a pretty decent description of love, uh, check out what he says next. Love is patient and love is kind. By the way, this might serve as a little bit of a mirror, so to speak, if anybody needs it to see how you're doing. You know, if you need a little checkup this morning, you know, kind of like going in for a physical checkup. This might be a spiritual checkup today, you know. Putting the stethoscope right up next to your heart to see if it looks like this. Are you patient with people? Are you kind? If so, it's beaten with love. And if, if not, you're just getting that flat line. It's like, wait a minute. You know, let, me, let me check that again. Is, is anything happening in there? Uh, well, you might just want to, you know, do some evaluation of your life here this morning. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. And this kind of love never fails. We are called to love one another because he has first loved us. It is a commandment, not a nice suggestion. He commands us to love one another. You know, this is, uh, last week I, I preached about uh, the way that we are called to um, stand firm in the faith with great resolve like Daniel did, even in the midst of a hostile 
culture. You know, we are living in Babylon, so to speak, but we're not of Babylon. And Daniel, uh, David, Daniel, what am I saying? Daniel gave a great example for us to follow uh, so that we can stand firm, now, even when things get difficult. Um, this is another, that, that was one of the lost episodes of VBS. It's kind of how I said that. One of the ones that we didn't get to in our VBS week. Well, this message is kind of along that line. It's another lost VBS episode. Uh, if we would have had five full nights of VBS, this would have been the fifth night where we uh, learn what it means to speak the truth in love. And, uh, and I, I, again, I've said this before, but I like the way that the VBS material this year helped us with some apologetics a little bit. Not only knowing what we believe, but understanding why we believe what we believe. And to some degree, knowing how to uh, make good, rational, reasonable arguments or, uh, you know, for the faith. Contending for the faith, as Jude writes in, in that letter. Um, so, for instance, this last night would have said, uh, we would talk to the children this. Some people say, and a lot of people will tell you this. That if you don't agree with me, you don't love me. But God says, speak the truth in love. Now, Paul himself was a man with a background who hated Jesus, hated the church, hated anybody who thought anything well of the church. He wanted to wipe them all out. He wanted to put an end to this new way that had arisen, the way of Christ. But God miraculously met him on that road to Damascus. You can read about that in Acts chapter 9. Maybe you've heard some of that story. And that his life was changed 180 degrees. He who used to be such a violent opponent, a persecutor of the church, became one of the greatest spokespersons and missionaries that this world has ever known. And Paul then challenged the people to grow in their relationship with the Lord and to know God's truth. And uh, in particular, if you want to just look here for a second, in Ephesians chapter 4, he writes about this, uh, that we are to grow up in the faith, being, um, being equipped until we all, I'm here in verse 13 now, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood. I got to... Uh, Talk about maturity a little bit. I just I just had to get my uh, immaturity out of the way this week a little bit, and I went to the motorcycle races at the county fair. I mean, this was like my childhood relived all over again. Not that I ever raced, but I liked to ride dirt bikes when I was young, and I just kind of geeked out there in the stands at the grandstand watching the motorcycle races. It, was it a little immature? I don't know, maybe. Like going to the demolition derby tonight. Some of you might be heading out there. It's, I mean, I'm not saying you shouldn't go. You should go have fun, you know. Go to the tractor poles and all that kind of stuff. You know, is it the most mature thing in the world for me to go watch a bunch of people race motorcycles? Maybe not, but it was fun. I enjoyed it. But spiritually speaking, let's leave the childhood stuff in the past and let's grow to maturity. That's what Paul is saying to us here. So that, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes, rather, so instead of being immature, grow to maturity, rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. So when Paul writes here to the Corinthian church, as we've highlighted from chapter 16, verse 14, let all that you do be done in love. Whatever you, even when you speak, it ought to be spoken in words of love. With all the uh, description we've given to it there as well, patience, kindness, not insisting on having your own way about a matter, not rejoicing in wrongdoing, rejoicing in the truth. Now, this was especially meaningful for the church that he's writing to in Corinth because they were not an easy church to love. If you've read the first letter that Paul wrote to the Corinthian church, you might remember some of the reasons that he wrote this letter in the first place. This was, uh, these were not the kind of people that were just easy to love. You know, 
It's easy to love people who love you back, right? It's easy to love people who treat you well. And it's hard to step into messy situations and try to help people fix things in life. But love also does that because love cares enough to say, hey, if there's a problem going on in your life, in your situation, I am unwilling to just let it slide and let it go and not care enough about you to step in and say something. So that's Paul's heart to the church in Corinth as well. Because he cared so much about them, he was not willing just to let them keep doing the stupid, foolish, divisive things that they were doing. He said, listen, I've got to speak this truth to you. So he writes them an entire letter telling them some things that they needed to get right. So just for review for a second, you might remember some of this. But So what was wrong with the church in Corinth? Anybody know? Just I'll, I'll give you some interaction, right? audience interaction for just a moment. What were some of the problems or issues that the church in Corinth was facing that Paul had to address? Where are my Bible scholars out here in the room today, right? Favoritism. Yeah, we see that pop up in a number of different ways. Certainly at the Lord's Supper table in one particular case where, yeah, the rich and, you know, were kind of taking advantage of the poor at times like that, showing favoritism was an issue. Yep, good. Somebody else? I'm sorry? Selfish. Selfishness, yeah. Inwardly lustful. Inwardly lustful? Yeah, absolutely. There were, um, yeah, I'm not just... You know, not to get ahead of you in case somebody was thinking, oh, I was going to say that, but I'll go ahead and take the, the run on this for a second. Um, yeah, there were, there were false teachings happening regarding sexual immorality. All things are lawful, but not everything is beneficial, Paul has to say. So some had been kind of taught and were going that direction that, well, if everything is lawful, if I'm not under the law anymore, I can just go and do whatever I want. And that included... Uh, engaging in some sexual immorality that Paul had to say, well, no, wait a minute, time out. That's not to be you at all. In fact, we, we read a very similar thing uh, from Romans chapter 6 to start the service out today, right? So what does it mean? You know, should we continue on in sin that grace may abound? And the answer is no. Just because you're not under the law anymore does not mean that you're not obligated to be obedient to the ways of Jesus. You need, you need to, in fact, you need to strive to please him and honor him even more than you would having a written code. The power of the Spirit within you ought to compel you to want to please God. You don't, you don't need a law to tell you that sexual immorality is wrong. It ought to come from right here. He'll put it in your heart. So yeah, you had selfishness, you had sexual immorality. Uh, in fact, there was even a tolerance of sexual immorality. And he says, even of a kind that the pagans don't approve of. And you're boasting about that. You're proud about that. He says, no, you ought to do something about that. I love you too much to let that slide. Don't be so tolerant that you, you know, just let this immorality infest your, your body. The church is a holy body. Don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? And that you are called out, a holy nation, a royal priesthood, a people belonging to God. So get rid of the sin that taints and pollutes your body so that you can be a people that you're meant to be. So rather than just letting that sin go, they should have been lamenting it and removing the wrongdoer from the body. Anybody else? Other uh, thoughts about some of the stuff going on in Corinth that Paul had to address? As everybody's visually flipping back through, oh, what was that? I remember. They even, here, here's one. They even had issues where they would be so divisive against each other that they were bringing lawsuits against each other. Like Paul says, no, wait a minute. What in the world are you doing? You got to take your, your matters before an ungodly judge? Isn't there anybody wise enough among you to settle a dispute within the body? Why, why are you going to air your dirty laundry in the world? Don't do that. You know, try to figure out. And wouldn't it be better, in fact, to be wronged? Showing love to your brother and and taking the hit, so to speak, to maintain that relationship. But don't take it to a lawsuit. You've already lost if it gets that far. So various grievances like that, uh, all kinds of divisions, disunity within the church. Some were saying, I follow Paul, I follow Cephas, I follow Apollos, I follow Christ. You know, it's like, just bring it in. We're one team. We're on the same team. You don't go in four, five, twelve different directions. There ought to be unity in the body. 
Uh, there was also issues of people flaunting their spiritual gifts and elevating and speaking in tongues in particular above some of the other gifts. And he says, that's not the way you do it either. And uh, so making false teachings about uh, saying that the resurrection uh, or that there was no resurrection of the dead. And Paul takes an entire chapter, chapter 15, to address that. And he says, well, if there's no resurrection from the dead, then man, we're the foolishest of the fools out there, you know. All of all, most to be pitied. In all of these things that Paul hits head on and addresses, it is out of a heart of love for the church. And so he's going to say, and love also for you becomes the remedy to these issues that you're dealing with. On an underlying level, the foundation of it has to be that you need to love one another well. Let all be done in love. And it's not just that, hey, let's just all decide to get along no matter what. Let everybody do their own thing. That's not what he's talking about. It's a love that's grounded in Christ that is willing to confront sin and rebuke those out of line when necessary. And it all flows from the truth of the gospel of God. Now, it's also interesting to see. We've been looking at verse 14 primarily. Let all that you do be done in love. But what does he say right before that? It's actually interesting to see that this call to love comes on the heels of a call to arms, so to speak. Be watchful. Stand firm in the faith. Act like men. Be strong. Employing some uh, military metaphoristic language. Metaphoristic? Is that a word? Metaphors, anyway. Military metaphors that uh, maybe I should uh, coin a new word today. Uh, that um, that really help engage their minds in understanding how vigilant he wants them to be concerning these matters of the truth. So just very quickly, when he says be watchful, it, it means stand on guard. I mean, you, just like you station a sentry out on guard to be aware of when the enemy is encroaching upon the camp. We always need to have our eyes open, to be sober-minded, to be aware of the dangers around us. Because I can tell you this, that spiritually speaking, we've got an enemy that is out there seeking to kill, steal, and destroy. Prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And I'm telling you, he is, he is not giving up and he is not quitting. And if you are a believer in Christ Jesus, and if you are a new believer in Christ, nor Warren, you've got a target on your back, right? We've, we've got to know that we are engaging in spiritual warfare. So therefore, we've got to be Watchful. Now, you could also say it this way that uh, uh, some scholars have said there's also um, connecting it with chapter 15 when we are to look for the return of Christ, thinking about his second coming, that there is an idea of not only be, being watchful against the advances of the enemy of our soul against us, but this idea of being watchful of expecting Jesus uh, to come again. Uh, and, and he tells us in so chapter 24, chapter 25 in particular, how we ought to always be ready for that day. Be on guard, be watchful, ready and watching for the day of Christ and living our lives in a way that when he comes, that we will not be ashamed at his coming. That we'll be found doing the things that he has called us to do, being faithful and true to his word. So we, just, we always need to be watchful. We need to stand firm in the faith. We are not called to be pushovers, to be wishy-washy, to be wavering back and forth between opinions and philosophies and, you know, checking the pulse and see which way the wind and culture is blowing to know what direction we're going to go. No, stand firm in the faith, in the truth of the Word of God. Don't be easily deceived. Don't be misled. Yes, there will be false teachers. Yes, there will be false prophets. There will be all kinds of people looking to sway you one way or the other, you stand firm in the faith. That's what he's saying. We read that already in Ephesians chapter 4. Don't just uh, you know, go with the way the wind's blowing. Ephesians chapter 6, come back to that and uh, see how Paul writes about putting on the full armor of God so that we can withstand in the evil day, so that we can stand firm in that faith. So it's firm in the message of the gospel for one thing, and, and that's 
Uh, that's part of that faith, but it's the entirety of the teaching of God's word, starting with the belief that there is one God, the creator of heaven and earth, who has made everything uh, perfect. In the Garden of Eden, God laid it all out just for man to enjoy, and it was everything was good. It was right. It was as it ought to be. And it was only when sin came into the picture that everything went downhill from there. Brokenness, disease, divisions, all these problems that Paul has addressed to the Corinthian church, immorality of all kinds, murder, yeah, you name it. It all flows from what happened in the garden when Adam and Eve sinned against God curse of sin entered the picture. And from there on, death has taken hold. But we are called to stand firm in the faith. Jesus Christ has come. He has given his life for our salvation. He has risen from the dead, conquering sin and death for all time. And we can stand firm because that is truth that will not be shaken. Then he says, act like men and be strong. Again, it's just a call for men and women both to be men of valor, to not be cowardly, to not be weak. There will be pressures of the world that we will have to face. We are living in Babylon. But we are to act out of the convictions of the truth of Christ, empowered by the Holy Spirit within us, standing firm in the rock of God's word and his truth and his salvation that ought to lead us to be strong, to be courageous, in the face of all that we will face. So you get this balance to some degree. Balance between the strength and the courage that it will take for us to live faithfully in this world, but also making sure that it's not just a, you know, bull in a china shop, full steam ahead, you know, swords out, guns up, you know, fists bared, ready to, you know, knock some people over the head. It's not that. It's tempered with do it all in love. Do everything that you do in love. I remember reading a book several years ago, a number of years ago now, um, by Stu Weber called, uh, the title was Tender Warrior. Is that book familiar to anybody else? Anybody else read that? And, and it's just all about this contrast, or not really contrast, the, the merging is a better way of saying that, the merging of being tender-hearted like Jesus, but also a warrior like Jesus. And Jesus exemplified both in a, in a great way. He was tender, uh, you know, even saying, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. You know, we like that tender, gentle Jesus, and, and that is his heart. That is who he is. But you also see a Jesus who is unafraid to confront the religious leaders of the day who are teaching false traditions and uh, leading people to not uh, come to Jesus and pulling people away from him. And you see him up in the face of some that he needed to get in the face of and call them out for their sin. So you get, you get both. In Jesus, you get a tender warrior. And I think that's what Paul is saying in a lot of ways for us to uh, let all that you do be done in love. But that doesn't mean you're just a pushover and, uh, and not strong. Be watchful. Stand firm in the faith. Act like men. Be strong. <coughs> I agree. So that's what we're going to do. So we are called to love one another. And let me just say it this way uh, to, to conclude this, this morning. Listen, this is what the world needs to see. They need to see something different. Man, we are, we are in a climate where it just seems like people are so quick to be offended, so quick to hold a grudge, so quick to get mad about things and you know, and we can look at all kinds of different examples. I don't, you don't need me to, uh, to do that for you. But, um, but when we are loving like Jesus called us to love, like the Bible commands us to love, strength, yes, unafraid, standing in that truth, yes, but also with a heart of compassion and love for people, that's what is going to turn this world around. Listen, if your hope is in new president getting elected that's going to make everything better, a political party, you know, coming into power that is going to change the direction. Well, on a temporal level thing, yes, it's important that we vote. It's important that we support candidates we agree with and everything else. I'm not dismissing that by any measure. 
But I'm telling you, it's, it's the church that needs to be the change agent in this world. Don't wait for politicians to do that. That's not their job. It's our job. And it's love grounded in this courage and this strength that we have in Jesus that will win the day. People, I'm telling you, people are going to, they're going to get tired of the way things are going in this world. A lot of people are already fed up with stuff happening. They're looking for something different. And if they don't find that in the light of the church, shining the light of Jesus into this world, then we have, we have failed in our job. They need to see it differently in us. Listen, people are searching. They're, you know, what, I, I just want to ask this question. What's going to make them run to Jesus when the world lets them down? What's going to make people want to, to find uh, the, the hope of salvation that we proclaim when the worldly ways will leave them empty and high and dry? Buried guilt and shame at the end of the day. Listen, we've got to be people who love well. Agape. Selfless. Generous. Sincere. Truly caring. Sacrificial love that, that looks, you know, practically speaking, like treating people with respect and kindness. Even when they disagree with us. Maybe especially, <laughs> excuse me, when they disagree with us. That's when you really put it on display. In your words, in your attitudes, your body language, your actions, it all ought to agree. Practically speaking, forgiving people when we've been wronged might be a really good way of putting the love of Jesus on display. In a world where nobody else does that, nobody else is doing that. People are holding grudges, they are getting mad, they are looking for ways to get even. But when you, in Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, can forgive a wrong that has been done to you, you are putting the agape of God on display for people to see. They, they need to see that. Going out of your way to serve someone who is in need. Serving somebody who needs a helping hand. Who's, uh, to, to encourage, to bless, to care for, to help will make a big difference. When nobody else is doing that, everybody's so consumed about getting to where they're going to go, looking out for number one themselves, but when we can put others ahead of ourselves, we can look out for the interests and needs of others and serve and bless other people. People in this world aren't doing that. And the church had better be doing that. Showing hospitality, being generous, ready to share. Man, there's a whole ton of stuff I could look at uh, with you here this morning. But let's, just, let's be people who take this command seriously to love one another. And let everything that you do be done in love. I was reading a book recently, it's still reading it for that matter, um, I left it down there, but it's uh, Gracia Burnham, her story. She and her husband Martin were missionaries in the Philippines, and uh, the reason this story was pretty compelling to me is uh, they were there serving in the Philippines during the early 2000s, and their story came to light, maybe some of you have heard of it, uh, when they were taken captive by terrorists in the Philippines, and they were held kidnapped and held hostage for about a year and a half. And um, so we were in Kansas City Seminary at the time, and they were they're from the Kansas City area. And so it was often in the news and on the radio, you know, be praying for the Burnhams. And so I just, I remember their story quite well from that time. And uh, so the, the end of the story is that after a year and a half, uh, in a rescue attempt to free Marcia, uh, Martin and, and Gracia, as, as well as one other that was with them, um, only, only Gracia survived that rescue attempt. Uh, both her husband and this other uh, captive were, were killed in the, in the work. So she is, she's gone on to write a couple of books that are pretty incredible about her story and, and how all that plays out. But the thing that intrigued me was the way that she writes in her about learning to love her captives. Having, having just a God-filled Compassion for those who had taken her hostage and were treating her and her husband and this other lady just absolutely terribly and cruelly. And, uh, and she said, I mean, that wasn't easy. And she, she writes that in there, you know, and she had to kind of get to that place. She was angry a lot uh, about the way that she was being treated and the unfairness of other you know, things going on. And, and she even writes about the ineptitude of the you know, Philippine military that couldn't save them and even the U.S. government that didn't seem to be offering much help. And, so she was frustrated and angry about a lot of things, but 
over time, especially with the help of her husband and his guidance and leadership, that uh, she learned to start loving those who had taken her captive. And if you want to talk about change in the world, start loving people who hate you, who you might even call your enemies, those who disagree with you, those who want nothing to do with you, those who hate Jesus, who hate the church. When we can put that kind of agape love on display, God can take that and it, he will shine it as a brilliant light into the darkness of this world. And maybe it'll just be compelling enough to lead somebody to say, I want that. I need that in my life. At the end of the day, it is the love of God that he has for us that compels us to love. Let's let our love for the Lord Jesus Christ, first and foremost, with all of our heart, our mind, our soul, and our strength, be what drives us to love our neighbor as ourselves and to love even our enemies. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for the love that you have for us. God, you have poured out your kindness and your mercy and your compassion and your grace in ways that we will never know, ways that we certainly don't deserve, could not earn, but yet you have made a way possible for us to be saved through your son, Jesus Christ, who shed his blood on the cross of Calvary so that we might be forgiven, so that we might have this promise of everlasting life with you. God, I pray that for all who are hearing my voice today. And just like Nora has given her heart, her life to you, trusted in this good news message of the gospel, Lord, I pray that some soul will come to faith in Jesus Christ, even today, if that would be your will. God, we are so grateful for what you've done for us. Lord, you are a God who is patient with us. We praise you for that. A God who is kind. But yet, we also know that your patience and your kindness does not mean that salvation is automatic or universal. It requires, on our end, repenting and believing, receiving this gift that you so desperately want us to receive. But yet, you will not force it upon us. We know that. And ultimately, those who reject it will face eternal judgment. So God, my prayer, my earnest desire today is that by your spirit, you would do a work in every heart that only you can do to lead everyone to salvation. And friend, let me just address you. If that's you, maybe you're sitting here today just knowing that you need to do something. Your life is not right. It's, you're not living a godly, Christ-centered life. Maybe you never put your faith in Jesus. Maybe you have, but you've wandered so far away. You're not sure if there's a pathway home. Friend, I'm just I'm here to assure you today that the Father waits with arms wide open for you to come home, for you to put your faith and trust in Jesus. And maybe you just need to offer a prayer like this, very simply saying, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I know that I have strayed from you. I know that I've been selfish and foolish and I've done some pretty ignorant and stupid things and things that I've regretted and now I'm living with the guilt and the shame of that but Lord I'm hearing the message of hope and I'm hearing that your blood shed on the cross can forgive me and so I want that and I need that and I receive that by faith today thank you for dying in my place on the cross and Jesus I do believe that you rose from the grave conquering sin death and hell forever. And so I am asking you to come in and be Lord and Savior of my life. Be the king of my heart and help me to live my life wholly for you, faithfully, devoted <coughs> to you alone. I'm all yours. God, I thank you for the work you're doing in the hearts and lives of the people here today. So Lord, now let us respond as we ought to, because you are so good to us. You are full of love and mercy and compassion. God, we praise you. We thank you for that. We want to live in that love. We want to shine that light of love into a world that so desperately needs to see it. Help us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
at this invitation time as we prepare to sing this next song. I don't know how you need to respond in particular to this word today. But if you prayed that prayer, God, I'm a sinner. I need you. I'm trusting in you for salvation. I would love nothing more than for you to make a bold move here today. And that is that when we stand to sing the song of invitation, as you stand, just get right out of the pew and come right down here to the front. I'll be standing right up here just saying, Pastor Rob, I need Jesus, and I'm trusting him for, for my salvation today. And we'll rejoice together with you. I would love for you to do that as we stand. Maybe somebody else needs to respond in a different way. Maybe it's like Nora, that you just you need to be baptized. Maybe you got saved back in February. But now you want to make it public, and you want to go all in and go all out and, and uh, get baptized. That's the next step you need to take. I would love to talk with you here this morning, too. Spirit's prompting you today. You need to respond. Don't, don't quench the Spirit's work. Do what He tells you to do. Let's stand together. You respond in faith and obedience today.